You're listening to the Cash Flow Academy podcast with Andy Tanner, your source for investing made easy. Here's Andy Tanner. Welcome to the Cash Flow Academy podcast, where investing is made simple. I'm your host, Andy Tanner, and we welcome you. We congratulate you for listening. We commend you. And uh, today's program going to be an interesting show for sure. And it's been a while since we've had my good friends, uh, Noah Davidson and Corey Halliday with us. We're going to talk a little bit about the market today with uh, the people that teach at the Cashflow Academy. So Noah, welcome. Corey, welcome. How are you guys doing? Good. No, one, no one wants to speak over. I'll, I'll, I should have done I should have <laughs> set up this way. Noah, how are you doing? <laughs> I am well. Thank you very much. You're well. And Corey, how are you doing? I'm doing well as well. You guys are overly <laughs> polite. We'll never talk over each other. What a great group of guys. Let's let's talk a little bit. Of, you know, we're going to do some podcasts. I, You guys are not only uh, business associates, fellow investors, but we're all really good friends personally. And you guys know my personality. I tend to wear my emotions on my sleeve. So I'll start off by saying, um, as of this recording, I don't know how long it'll take to, to get it up. The producers are really good about it. As of this recording, you know, things are tough. I'm going to do a couple of podcasts this week. Don't know when they'll be published, but uh, right now my spirit is just, it, it's so interesting. You know, I, I, I feel like my context is I'm a person that's here on the earth to give people answers as a teacher, right? This is how to do stuff. I figure it out and then I try to help other people figure it out. That seems to be my niche. It seems to be what I'm good at. So, you know, if you're in any of our programs, the letters I like the best, man, Andy, you made this stuff simple. So we're answer givers. And uh, when I look at finance, like with coronavirus hit, everyone's saying, okay, what do we do? I says, here's what we do. And anyone that, you know, tuned in our education over the past two, three months, took courses over the last three months, I, uh, if they followed what was taught, um, they really came out really well, you would think, if they followed what we did. But I got to tell you guys, Politically, socially, looking at uh, this, I know you guys share when we, you know, we just send our love to not just George Floyd and his family, but anyone who's been uh, affected in that way, discriminated against. You know, I can't hold a candle. I've had, everyone has their share of discrimination, whether it's on this or that. Yeah, people don't like you, but I, I can't honestly say I even have a context of what that family's going through. So I, all I can do is take the pains that I've felt in my own life, times them by a thousand, and hope that's in the ballpark. So before we get into stock market stuff, just a you know just a word of of uh, support, I guess, love, solemnity. Um, you know, I, I feel for the you know my my brother is you know one of those officers that's put on his riot gear and go out there and get spit on. I thought well, my brother, he's the guy that you know, in the news story before, saved this family from a freaking burning building by kicking the door in and saving this family's life. And I don't even tell you the truth, I don't even know what color the family was. Uh, I don't think he cared either. And so there's this huge swell of people that I love and know on every side of this issue, and it's just been painful. So anything you guys want to say about that before we get into stock stuff? I just, I just feel like we should yeah. talk about it. I think it's important at this time, I mean, it is your heart goes out to anyone that has been discriminated against and and you obviously you know you want to do your part and i feel kind of hopeless a little bit in doing my part like I'm, maybe i'm not making any difference but i try to hopefully influence those in my circle um and and change some of those things and do as much as i can to further progress and make it so that truly everyone is free and everyone is treated equal. And that's the goal. That's the goal is to get everybody to that point. And I know that that's not always the case, you know, and I'm on a similar side as you and that I have family members. So growing up, I grew up in a, in a town where my father was the chief of police while I was in my high school years and so on. So I've seen that Both end sides. of it. And yeah. yeah. And, and obviously I know, knowing my father that he didn't care what anybody looked like or their, you know, race or religion or anything like that. He treated everyone, I think, fairly and, and so forth. And so there are good, very, very good people and there's more good than bad, but 
doesn't take a lot the of bad times out. The, yeah. Yeah. It doesn't take the bad out and, and the bad gets more publicity and more news and, and more hits on websites and so on. And unfortunately the bad is still there, you know, and there's it this, really is. you just want to eliminate that as much as you can. For so me, just trying to help our circle. I think one of the traps I felt fell into years ago, not in recent years, but one of the traps I fell into is like, because I don't feel animosity towards any particular race. Oh, it must be overblown because I know I don't feel that way. Well, guess what? Other people do. Other people yep. do. And you talked about your circle of influence. I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to ask the question is, okay, what can I do? And the answer I have right now is, I don't know. I don't know what to do, but I know I want to do something. So my big thing you know, this is not a political podcast or, you know, it's about finance. So we'll stick with that topic, but I'm going to look, I'm going to look in my, like, I don't want when these riots calm down or anything, go back to usual. I want to be doing something different than I did today. I don't know what that looks like. And so, you know, I'm, I'm going to be more active in reaching out and having conversations with those in my circle of friends who are affected by this, that maybe don't talk to me about it as much. Say, Hey dude, what can I do? Right. What can I do moving forward? Noah, you got anything before we hop into stock market on this? Oh, I want to, again, I'd like to echo your exact same sentiments. Um, it, it's a challenging time. I mean, it's very, very emotionally charged. And, you know, you, you see a lot of, of just bad actors out there that are just driven by this, this emotion. And, and it's probably not the healthiest way to respond to things. But what I, what I do see is, is in the aftermath, very, you know, calm, collective people coming in to clean it up. Yeah. So I, th- I think that uh, that's the one thing that I, you know, I always find when I see these types of situations, and I don't know that we've seen anything quite like this, but the vast majority of people are there to help yeah. and to come out. And I think that the better angels of our nature do, do come out. And, you know, it's unfortunate that we get to see the ugly parts of our nature. Cause I mean, angry mobs don't discriminate very well, nope. but you know, we, when we can be, be kind yeah. to, to everybody out there we and you don't mentor, know what they're going through. We did a mentor you know? club earlier and we were kind of looking at the 10 commandments for like, all right, let's start with don't kill. Let's start with that one. Thou shalt not kill. And then don't steal would be a nice one. Then I don't think love your neighbor as yourself is one of the 10 commandments, but it's, it's in the same book. So we'll take it. And let's just, let's just start with those three. You know, the Bible's kind of thick, but if we could just pull out those three, don't kill people. Okay. Whether you're a police officer or not, don't kill people. That'd be a hell of a thing to start with. And then don't steal stuff that isn't yours and love, love your neighbor. That's beautiful stuff. Let's talk about the stock market. So here's the question, and this is really the real topic of the podcast. Um, we're going to do more, though, on this uh, inequality. We're going to do more on this. I vow to do that because it affects people's cash flow. It is, it, it is a, you know, part of what we talk about, but I want to have some good thought and preparation before we try to take on some of those more difficult ideas. Um, for now, we'll, let's stick with what we do know how to fix or what we do know how to react to, uh, at least fix on a personal level. And let's talk about the stock market for a minute. Corey, have you ever seen unemployment like this in your life? Never in my life. And I don't know if we've ever in history seen unemployment skyrocket the way that it has in Just such quick. a short period of time. I think it's it's record breaking in the wrong way, right? All the the wrong direction, more unemployed in such a short period of time than ever before. Pretty wild. Absent fiscal policy and absent monetary policy. Okay. So those are off the table. Okay. Noah, all you can look at is like producer price indexes and, you know, managers purchasing indexes and, you know, all the numbers, earnings coming in, money being made, GDP numbers, all the stuff. Show me a positive number. Show me a number that should make the market go up in terms of data. Show me a number. No, uh, other than the expectation that it might have been worse. That's the only way I can see people interpreting those numbers as a positive is if, you know, by comparison, they weren't as bad as expected. But there, there's not a lot of good numbers out there to, you know, for a fundamental analyst or a value investor to really hang their hat on. You look at what you said about expectation, which is a huge thing. You can have a negative number and have the market pop because it wasn't as bad as you thought. Okay, let's go to unemployment. 
They, they had a number, it was worse. They had a number, it was worse. They had a number, it was worse. You know, so you have a good point that there might be some numbers that we didn't think was worse, but there's not a number out, out there that says this is great. And yet, where's the technology sector at? Is it recovered yet? I mean, it's within a Maybe. day of recovery. I mean, it's, with one, Pretty much. it's within a candle. Is it, how many yep. ATRs do we have to move to have that thing hit up there, do you think? One, two? Well, let's even, let's even put it this way. On a one-year basis, it's, it's well in the positive. So if we yeah. look at from where we were just a year 2020 ago. 2020 is a positive experience. A oh, my gosh. Yeah. Now, that's the context right there. If you, be, if you started out your investing career at the beginning of 2020, you're positive. Now, that, Corey, that's the show. I mean, that's the show, really. Of all the years that have sucked in this last little, in the last 10 years, so far, this one's got to take the cake. I mean, I'm sure we can go back and find some nasty things in the last 10 years, but I'll tell you what, we've had a 10 year run in the market that's been awesome. We've had, you know, all this stuff. 2020, if you started your investing career at January 2020, you're in the black. That's amazing to think about. On that, on that NASDAQ 100, it's, it's positive year to date. And so you think about it in terms of, and what you said, absence, physical policy and monetary policy, but we're not living in a world that's absent those, right? Okay. So where would the markets be with over 30 million jobless in the last month? You know, this is the perplexing question is how do we, how do we take all this negative data and then look at a stock market like the NASDAQ, which is now positive year to date, and how do we reconcile those two? That's an interesting thing. So let's talk, we're, we're going to talk about two things. And if you don't understand what we're talking about, let's give ourselves a plug. Go enroll in the four pillars of investing so you can learn enough to have, be in the conversation. You know, you have two choices. When, when I see something on CNBC that I don't understand, I can either tune out and say, well, it's beyond me and quit. Or I can say, time to research. Let's go. Let's figure this out, right? And I tend to lean to the latter because that way you get smarter. So if there's something you don't understand, that's a clue right? Get educated. So we might talk about some stuff that is higher level than maybe the beginning investor has. Great. If we say something you don't understand, well, A, tune out. B, get smarter and tune in, you know, tune in more. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about fundamentals and I'm going to talk to you guys about your opinions on the detachment, if there is any, of the market from fundamentals. So let me give you an example. What a stock price should be a function of. In other words, the stock, pri stock price is a function of X. And I think we're going to come up with two or three different answers where you could fill in that blank that, well, Andy, stock price is a function of uh, belief in the future. Or stock price is a function of supply and demand. Or stock price is a function of fundamentals. All of those arguments we're going to make. Fair enough? Interesting? Yep. Index fund. SPX index fund, Vanguard 500 index fund. These index broad-based funds invest with the idea and the foundation of diversification. The random walk theory, uh, which means you really can't predict how well a company is going to do in the future. Some are going to make it, some are not. Now listen to this, hence Invest in both. Invest in both. And your winners will outnumber your losers because as a whole, we have faith in the overall economy over time. That is, I mean, that, that is the most oversimplified investing strategy. Diversify on the grounds that we believe long-term things will rosy, more good things to companies will happen than bad things. And yeah, we'll reshuffle this S&P from time to time but we're going to have to invest in some losers along with the winners to get exposure to the index fund. Everybody with me? Yes. We're yep, good. Yep. Okay. So I begin to do that and these begin to grow in popularity. And we, we decide in 1980 to do a 401k with Ted Benna. And now we have not millions, not billions. We have trillions of dollars going into diversified investments via the 401k. What that means is, We've got a ton of money going into companies that probably don't deserve it because our attitude is not, oh, here's a great investment. 
Our attitude is not, let's do a fundamental analysis like Warren Buffett does. Warren Buffett looks at each and individual company, each one. He doesn't have one stock that he's diversified into saying, well, I just don't want to have all my eggs in one basket here. Every single stock he buys, every one, he looks at that business with Charlie Munger and he says, this is a good business. I want to own it because of the numbers behind this business. There are no businesses held by Berkshire Hathaway with the attitude of, of the late John Bogle, who says, no, nah, just buy it all and let the market take care of you. And so please understand, everyone, that one strategy is attached to fundamental investing that says the stock price should be a function of the company's growth and earnings. And that's right out of Benjamin Graham's Intelligent Investor, that the stock price should be a function of the company's growth and the company's earnings. Growth meaning sales growth, not stock price growth. And, and, and if we can find something that's undervalued where we say, hmm, this stock price temporarily is not in line, let's buy it now. And then it'll come in line and the dividends will come in line. It'll be a great profitable business. That's attached to fundamentals. But the, the mutual fund stuff is not. So with that long-winded, as always with me, long-winded setup and context, because the context is so important, to what degree has money, the trillions of dollars put in 401ks, detached the market from fundamentals? Because here's the deal. If I buy a stock, even if the company sucks, if I buy the stock, that creates supply and demand. So is the stock price a function of supply and demand or is it a function of fundamentals or what it should it be? Either of you can take it. No one's got well, nothing what it, to say. Well, what, what's that all about? No, those, those, I'm just processing the question. That's a lot to unpack right there. Um, you know, it, obviously it should be, you know, a forward looking estimate or a forward looking guideline. But when you, when you talk about, you know, the 401k and, and the index fund, well, that means every payday money's being funneled into the market. In, whether the market probably, deserves it or whether not, the market's, yeah, whether the market in, deserves that money or not, 401k, that's what I mean. Go Keep going. Right. So when money comes in indiscriminately, it, it's not being funneled into specific stocks per se, as much as it is going funds. to be funneled into, into index funds. Well, that raises an interesting question for those unemployment numbers. So if you do have a big increase in unemployment, that means you would have a drop in 401k money going into the market automatically. So there's that. But I, th I mean, again, I think that uh, in a world, you know, without monetary policy and fiscal stimulus, I would expect very different outcomes from the market right now. So here's, but, what's, here's what's interesting. The truest statement is price is a function of supply and demand. That's the truest of all the statements, right? Price is a function yeah. of supply and demand. So think about this. That, that in and of itself relies on an intelligence of the investing community. That alone says that the, the community is wise enough to price these and understand their value. In other words, the price of an iPhone, people know what an iPhone is, people know what an iPhone does. And so when Apple comes out with a new price, you know, if it's too high, people aren't going to buy it because they're going to understand Look, they can't look. Let's say they came out with a new iPhone and it really didn't have anything more than this. You know, it's got one other emoji or whatever, and they triple the price. They say, This is a $3,000 phone now. People aren't going to buy that. And Apple knows that. They're not going to buy that. But when it comes to stock market, does a 401k investor know whether he's getting value for what he's paying or not? So, so I'm saying, Is there a detachment and a bubble that's created by stuff being bought? that doesn't deserve to be bought. Corey? Yeah, and there there are constantly bubbles that form throughout the economy, and usually it's a function of a couple of different mixes, right? You get this supply-demand shift that's really wacky where demand increases, and, and it's a product of emotion oftentimes. Like, you can go back as far as the tulip bubble. I mean, how crazy yeah. is it that people would pay up mania. for for a tulip, for a flower, and if you go read about that bubble, it's insanity. It is. That people would care that much about this flower, but simply because other people cared about it and were getting rich, Supply the fear of not getting rich with everyone else forced you 
or a lot of people to go chase this tulip mania. Well, if you look at Bitcoin, the dot com bubble, <coughs> Bit, Bitcoin, <coughs> Bitcoin, Bitcoin yeah. or the dot com bubble, remember how many people wanted to invest and become day traders on technology stocks because they saw their neighbor get a brand new boat that they paid off because of some tech stock that came in. And they said, well, I'm smarter than that guy. I got to get involved in this. I can make more money. And so these emotions pile in. The housing bubble, same function. You talk to people in the mid-2000s and everyone wanted to invest in real estate and they wanted no interest loans and to leverage up and get six different houses and so on. So there's a function of emotion involved in these bubbles. And when we look at the stock market, what's kind of interesting about the stock market is this bubble seems to be fueled more on the corporate side than the individual side. It's not that people are losing their mind chasing the market. It's more that professional investors seem to be institutional the fear money. of missing out. It's the it, institutional money and saying, if the Fed is going to keep pumping up prices and I underperform and I bet against the market, then I'm going to lose my job. So I'm just going to keep buying because I don't want to miss out. This fund manager that I'm competing with, he's going to blow me out of the water. So I keep buying so that I can keep up with him and somebody else keeps buying so they can keep up with me. It seems to be an institutional level bubble more than a consumer yeah. or more than an individual. The individual has kind of gone a little bit more on the – the side of index funds, if you look at the fund flows, but on the institutional side, we seem stocks. to be creating a bubble and fueled by the Fed when it's all, when it is what so, it all boils down to. So that's kind of where I wanted to head with this is the reason I talked about the 401ks is I think the 401k is something people do understand. Like when people, like, let's say you go back to 1950, what percentage of a person's paycheck went into the stock market? None. I mean, in the 50s, you were nuts if you were in the stock market. That was for aristocrats and rich guys. The average guy was not involved in the stock market. Is that fair to say in 1950? Correct. I mean, yep. a guy gets a paycheck. He's, you know, he's, it's just not, it just, did, they didn't have a 401k stuff where this guy's buying stock. He had a pension. You know, it's the company's job to invest, not his. So all of a sudden now you get trillions of dollars being put in. What would happen to the stock market? Okay, let's take out the consumers though. Let's say that next week uh, Trump comes out with an executive order saying stock market is too volatile, too risky. Uh, people aren't smart enough to invest in it. So no investing in 401ks for a year. We're just going to not put money there. You're going to put it somewhere else if he had that kind of power or whatever. What would happen to the stock market if all of a sudden that amount of money stopped flowing into it? Now, are the companies less valuable? No, they continue on and keep generating profits just like they would have. But do right? the stock but do the stocks keep going higher without the amount of money to keep buying them? Because you gotta yeah, buy would... something. See, the, the thing I'm getting to is if you're gonna put money in your 401k, you gotta buy something. So what if everything sucks? You still gotta buy it. Right? If it fundamentally sucks and all these numbers are terrible, you're still putting money away, you're still buying it. Well, I'm buying it cheaper, yep. you're still buying it. And and influxes of cash cause the market to rise. Now let's go to your point. Now that we understand the idea of this detachment between fundamentals versus supply and demand. So the market is getting Fed money indirectly. I mean, the Fed prints money, they see that as an indirect benefit to what they're doing. Yes? Correct. They say, hey, there'll be, you know, whatever people need is going to be there. They're going to be able to buy stuff. We're going to be able to keep people employed. There'll be loans. There'll be whatever we need to keep the economy going. There's also rumor, like Janet Yellen came out, absolutely serious. She's not in charge anymore, but she was a few years ago, and she said, we should give the Fed the power to buy equities directly. Tell, what do you think about that, Corey? Yeah, that's an interesting way to go because Japan is in that mode, right? Japan is going down that road, and, and I'm fearful of all of that because I think it further fuels this excessive risk-taking. There should be... If I'm going to invest in a business, back to your original point of what should you be buying? You should be buying future earnings. You should be Growth investing in a company because I believe that this company is going to be able to generate me for me a solid return because they're going to make X amount this year and more than that next year and more than that in the, the coming years. And when you get basically the central banks printing money 
and buying assets, they're pumping up the price, not because Japan's not buying equities, not buying ETFs, and they're actively doing this, but they're not doing it because they see some tremendous value or anything like that. They're doing it to try to fuel risk-taking, and, and they think that the side effects of that are going to be positive. They think it's going to generate more economic activity, put more companies companies with more capital to invest and hire people and so on. The problem with that is that there's ultimately ramifications to that. And if you get spread apart from what you should be worth and what you actually are trading at and you create these bubbles, there's a nasty effect when that pricing comes back to normal. And so if the Fed step, and it would only be one more step because the Fed is in there now. Doing it indirectly buying bonds and yeah. buying even corporate bonds, buying junk bonds, yeah. uh, high yield mortgage, bonds. So it, mortgage, it, it, bad mortgage yeah. stuff. Yeah. And it would only be one more step to go into buying equities. But I think that people are buying stocks in anticipation of that, whether it's today or in the future, they think, look, even if things get bad, we know the Fed's going to come in and start buying stocks. So they perceive that there's this, protection underneath them from the Fed. And I think people are pumping up the start stock market in anticipation of that for better or worse. And it might continue to fuel more upside here in the markets, quite honestly, because trying to get out in front of the Fed. But ultimately, you know, value and and what you're paying are two different things. You're are you buying something that's offering a good value or are you buying something because you're just chasing price. And I, as I soon as you start chasing price, huge risks just skyrocket well, in what and, you're doing. And here's what's crazy. If people ask me where the market's going, I think it's going to explode. I think it's going to go up really big because of exactly what you're saying. I think any fund manager, any of that institutional guys, they say, look, if the Fed's behind this and the Fed makes the decision it's going to let the market go, if I'm not investing and enjoying those returns in terms of capital gain, I'm going to get fired. I, mean, I have to be in or I'm going to get fired because yep. if, if I'm not participating, if the Fed decides to turn on the pump, you know, and we can talk about MMT and the risks of, of inflation another time. But I think people right now have looked at history, especially the last crash. And they said, look, the Fed has tremendous ability to prop up a market because they can just pour money into it. And think about it. What? What does money, what does printing money cause? Inflation. But what we're learning is it's what you spend it on. If you print money and you spend it in equities, equities go up because it takes more of that money to push it higher, right? Supply and demand. Am I thinking right? I think I am. Noah? Yeah. I don't think I don't think you're wrong by any stretch of the imagination. And if, you know, that's the thing is you I get the increase in risk, but at the same point in time, you know that that's just going to blow the asset bubble bigger. So you can, you have a choice, stay in cash or buy the asset that will, you know, you got to do something with the money. And if you you're putting it into assets. You want to stay in cash while we print it? <laughs> well, that's probably not wise, you know, and, and you want to, you want to own things. You want to own paper assets. You want to own real estate. You want to own things that, that uh, will increase in value. And I think, you know, I would not be surprised if we did see that happen. If there was, you know, another downturn or another another leg down yeah. the market, I think that's the next logical step for the Feds. And at which point in time, yeah, buying the dip has not. It's worked every time, and I guess it'll work until it doesn't. So, you know, that's probably my big question: is is well, okay, if you do buy, you know, what do you do about that? Because I think there's still risk, regardless. But if you feel backstopped by the feds, I think it's just going to embolden, you know, the, the market makers, just the way you've kind of laid it out. Exactly. That's exactly what will happen. The jump to invest directly is big though, because if you invest indirectly by printing money and infusing into economy, that's to make real commerce happen. Now oh, it's yeah. certainly a function of credit. I mean, but we've been away from, I talked with Richard Duncan about this and other podcasts everyone should listen to. 
is, you know, he says, look, it's not capitalism anymore, it's creditism. And he's got a great point is if credit stops expanding, we're already so far down that road. It'd be like if you stopped financing houses, the real estate market would be done. If you stop, fi- in fact, if you stop financing student loans, the education business and college tuition is going to plummet, right? I mean, once you begin to finance something with credit, and it's buy now, pay it off as we go, which actually isn't a bad thing if it's valuable. Look, your quality of life is better buying a house and paying it off over 30 years because inflation takes care of you. You're better off, mm, I'm not going to say maybe, depending on the degree you get. Uh, I wouldn't say it blanketly that it's smart to go into debt for a student loan, but you can see that it's buy now, pay over time. And buy now, pay over time has worked with certain things, like a house is a great example of many people who have found a successful you know, buy now, pay over time. Well, the more that happens, the faster things are purchased, the earlier in life people can get them. So what the Fed is doing is really expanding credit. Is that fair to say, Corey? Yeah, exactly. And I think the next step in that, like we've talked about, is into stocks. So if you take the bond market is much larger than the stock market in terms of size. So the bond market is gigantic, but at this point, so the fed has been actively involved in the bond market and it didn't matter about value. It mattered about driving bond prices up and yields lower, right? When bond prices go up, yields go down. So as they drive down interest rates, that spurs on economic activity. That's their whole philosophy. Well, they've put, I mean, their balance sheet has surpassed $5 trillion now. So they've put massive amounts of money into the bond market. The problem that they now sit in is basically with bond yields down at next to nothing. That's your problem. The new norm, zero. Yeah. And in some countries, it's negative interest rates. I think they're pushing on a string in the bond market. So is the next transition for them to the smaller to say, well, we're equities. not impacting bonds anymore. We take it to phase two, which is you've heard of all these quantitative easing where they're buying bonds, QE one, two, three. Now I wonder if the next phase is now we're actively going to start buying stocks and this huge transition of capital where Market. people start chasing stocks. Again, it doesn't matter about value. It matters about the, the risk side of it to these fund managers because the fund manager is looking at it as occupational hazard if they're not involved. And if I'm going to lose my job because I'm underperforming, well, then I'm going to try to keep up with everyone else. Whether it's a good value or not doesn't matter, and they manage a lot more money than the individual investor. So here, here's what's kind of frightening. If you think about the Schiller P.E., who tries to say that, you know, obviously price is related to earnings, right? And, or at least earnings growth. Um, but the PE is price earnings. I mean, it's just what it is. So we're at 28 right now, which means that you're paying $28 for the S and P that'll give you a buck every year. So your ROI to infant return is 28 years. It's 28.73. So 28 years and nine months. So that means if I buy this stock and it pays me a dollar dividend, you know, and that, and that's earnings, that's not even dividends, right? That's just earnings because they don't even pay out the entire earnings. You know, you're looking at 30 years to get your investment back in terms of earnings. So it really turns the stock market into a buy low, sell high deal where the actual Warren Buffett, who, if you look at his portfolio, half of it is companies that aren't publicly traded that he just owns outright. So you know that in Buffett's mind, half of Berkshire Hathaway's portfolio is about, can we actually sell the Fruit of Loom underwear? Can we actually sell the Seas candies? Can we actually sell the Dairy Queen blizzards? Those are all companies, you know, can we sell the RC Willie furniture? That has nothing to a stock price because those stock prices don't exist because those companies aren't traded. So Buffett sits there as a business owner in his mind saying half these businesses I own outright, there's no stock price to worry about. That's a great mentality for the ones he owns a lot of shares of because he doesn't worry about stock price. He worries about whether, I don't think he sold his airlines because stocks price were down. I think he sold his airlines because no one's going to fly. He says, I don't, you know, it's like if Dairy Queen, all of a sudden he says, hey, Dairy Queen's not going to be able to sell blizzards anymore. He'd probably get out of the Dairy Queen business, right? So, so the detachment from fundamentals, you know, where, where it comes to guys like you and I, we know that what will the PE ratios look like 
if they buy equities because now you're not creating credit you're propping up stock price you're not really creating credit for people to go buy products and services to make those companies more profitable you're just flat out buying stock prices isn't that kind of nuts yeah richard duncan thinks nuts. it's a great idea he thinks it's a great idea i think it's kind of nuts well my question is is can it be done in perpetuity it, that's a great that that's the thing is how high do you push it where you got pe ratios of 120 200 i mean we had pe ratios of 45 in the s p back in the 2000s when what companies weren't making any money relative to their price you had a whole bunch of internet stuff going on driving the prices higher on speculation of future earnings not current earnings well now what's your speculation of future earnings no your speculation isn't future earnings it's a future buying. We're going to just buy more stocks to buy more stocks to prop up the stock price to make yeah. sure the 401k you, people don't get killed. But man. If you look at it from a business perspective, it's, it doesn't make any sense because I always want to invest in a business that makes me a, a positive return and so on. And that's my focus is what can this company do for me? That's the Warren Buffett. That's the fundamental yep. analysis of how good is this business going to be? And as soon as you get into the Fed game, it no longer matters about the earnings. It's all about, well, how many trillions of dollars are they going to pump into this? Because we have to factor that in. Why has the stock market been on an absolute tear as 30 million people have lost their jobs in the short term? Because they stepped in with trillions of dollars of stimulus, and that has a that has an impact. And so the market yeah. now, as opposed to in the past, you know, in decades prior, we didn't have to factor in the Fed involvement in terms of buying assets. Now we have to say the old "don't fight the Fed" adage. When they can just print money, well, of course they have more money than everyone else because they can just print as much as they want. So that pushes the equation to where you used to think there was an upper boundary. You thought, well, stocks can't trade too much above this. This is normal PE ratios on a historical basis. Here's how much they should earn versus my investment cost. Now all those things have to, I don't know if you can say you throw them out the window, but you definitely have to factor in the Fed involvement into your calculations yep. and say, well, we can trade a lot differently now than we have in the past based on these factors and trillions and trillions of dollars of stimulus. You know, I've never liked to be a buy low health sell high necessarily, but there's a certainly, you know, that there's an appeal to that idea with the fed. And that's why everyone's going to get in if, if the fed continues to stimulate because you just can't bet against them. So the answer to the question, you know, for those that just tuned out and couldn't figure out what the hell we're talking about is you know, the question is simply this. Why is the stock market so high when unemployment and all the other numbers say it should be being devastated? No one dares bet against the Fed. The, the fear of losing out on an upside of a Fed that is going to take care of its wealthy stockholders is too great. Is that safe to say? that? I mean, are we accurately analyzing, when we look at these charts going up with the underlying fundamentals sucking or is it genuinely just optimism? Like Warren Buffett, he thinks it's going to be short-term horrible, but long-term, you know, we always resilient. It's always, you know, the time to buy is when it crashes, you know, all that stuff. Have people just figured out that you buy the dip, like Noah said? Or is it really about the Fed? What do you guys think? I think it's really about the Fed. Well, I think it's all about the Fed, without a doubt. I mean, that's... Don't fight the Fed. That's all, that's all you can really say to that, right? So the, the risk in my mind, everyone, is that the Fed seems committed to propping up the market at the at the risk of the value of their own currency. What are, you know, the, the, the dumb question to ask is, what should I do? That's just an advice question. The smart question is, what should I study? Sovereign fundamentals and monetary policy, modern monetary theory versus traditional monetary theory, that's what I'm studying right now. It's hard as I can. I'm trying to figure out more about MMT. I think that's where we're going, guys. And I don't think we have a choice. I think that if we went on the fundamentals, obviously it's depression, right? I mean, we have the same fundamentals we did in 1929. True? Yeah. We'd gone through yeah. the roaring 20s and then the bubble burst. So, and 
So base the depression hit. Yeah, so that was a depression, not an inflation. And so the, the, the powers that be have said, we're not doing that again. And we will print any amount of money necessary to keep from deflating. Well, that means you're blowing up a bubble with, with inflation. And people don't want to miss out on asset inflation. Even if it doesn't come to, like, you know, your bowl of cereal in the morning type inflation or gasoline inflation, I think it's poised to have asset inflation. That's why I'm bullish in the stock market. I'm bullish that the market will go higher, even higher than it is. So we'll find out if I'm right. Final thoughts yeah, on, or can you give us, not final thoughts, but summation. What, so give me a summary of what you think this is. Give me a summary, Corey. Well, so I would summarize this as Fed involvement is the single largest factor in the stock market and in asset prices in today versus any other time in history. So you have to factor them into every investment that you're making. You have to factor them in because they're influencing interest rates. So whether you're a real estate investor, stock investor, it doesn't matter. You have to factor the Fed's involvement in. And that hasn't been the case in, in decades past where you didn't have to in, in, you didn't have to include them in your calculations. And so, you know, that leads us towards more risk taking, oddly enough, even though the markets don't seem as attractive on a historical basis in many of these ways, it's they have trillions of dollars of potential stimulus. And I think they're coming to the stock market at some point in the future which will continue to pump those asset prices higher. So it's hard to get super bearish, even though the data is really bad, when you have the Fed funneling trillions of dollars into the market. And, and it's really hard to be a, an investor, though. Look, it's hard to stay on the sidelines because the, the prices are going to rise. So from a stock price standpoint, it's hard to stay on the sideline. But from an asset ownership standpoint, hard for me to buy those stocks with that mentality because look the moment i buy the coca-cola company i'm more worried about what the beverage business looks like than the stock price and boy you could be buying some some businesses at some very high prices in the hope that they just go higher rather than really being in love with the business that you're buying fair to say right and i think there to that point i think there's still value out there where you can have the best of both worlds. If you know how to do fundamental analysis, then what we teach in the four pillars, you can still find value in the market. Let me give you an example. Apple was trading, you know, it recently went down a month or so ago to $170 per share. Yeah. Well, at that at that level, it was trading at a PE ratio of about 13, 14 Should've times bought. earnings. Should have bought. So at 13 to 14 times earnings, there's huge value there when compared to equities that's just the market as a whole. And you can do those types of comparison games where you can say, okay, I I think the Fed's going to pump this up, but I don't just have to buy everything. What I could say is let me dig into the fundamentals and really find some good value. And that's what we teach you to do in the four pillars. You do a better job at this than I think anybody else, Andy of making it simple and understandable when you teach those classes, showing them how to analyze a balance sheet, how to look at pricing and PE ratios and these factors. And uh, what is the, the four pillars is about 20 hours of of work, something like that, about 20 hours of of your time. And and most guys will go through it twice. So, so don't, don't fight the fed factor them in, whether you're real estate, stock, business, whatever you got to factor in the fed. That's your, that's your summary. Right? Exactly right. Noah. Well, the perma bears certainly are not having a good go of it. No. And I think it's not even just the Fed. You've got uh, international monetary funds and central banks also printing mm, money. And that money is also finding its way into the U.S. stock markets. You know, so it's, you know, you're seeing sovereign wealth funds pump money into U.S. markets from outside the U.S. as well. Good point. And it's, it's, you know, this is one of those things where I would actually really, I really agree with what um, Corey just said about, well, you, okay, take it one step further. So we've got the kind of a built in stimulus, you know, that in theory should continue to drive the markets higher, but why not also at the same point in time, 
try to do your best job to pick the best assets, you know, the best companies that still provide good value, good service that have intrinsic value um, to them. So, I mean, you can think of the corporations and the companies that are going to survive whatever kind of storm comes along. And that's another layer of defense for you to and build your confidence. When, Cause it, at a certain point in time, it kind of feels like you have to hold your nose and buy. Yeah. If, if you don't like the valuation that you probably still are going to see upward movement in price. And so, you know, why not get the stuff that you do want to buy anyway, own the companies you want to own. It's a fascinating market, guys. I thank you for your time. I hope people enjoyed uh, the conversation with some of our, you know, trainers and teachers here at the Cashflow Academy. It's, it's, I, you know, it's not a high level conversation, but it's not a beginner level conversation either. So, as Corey admonished you, you know, drop in, see what we have to to share with you, and we can teach you guys uh, this stuff. You know, Noah does the Mentor Club where we trade together every week. People get to watch what we're doing. Corey runs the coaching program where people can get – it's really a launch pad, right, Corey? It's like your first week – the first six weeks of, of trading is pretty important. And so to yeah. have someone to train you in a simulator for your first six weeks of, of effort, man, what a – what an advantage is to get started in the right direction that way. So I thank you guys for your expertise. You know, you guys are, I, I, I worry that we get in an echo chamber when we agree too much, but uh, you know, we're all very well connected outside of our own circle too. And uh, there's lots of things to think about. The one thing I would summarize with, man, it's never been more important to study money, man, never been more important to uh, to, to shrug your shoulders and think your average fund manager understands this stuff, uh, whew, that's a risk. Uh, to shrug your shoulders and say, well, the people that run the forum came must know what they're doing. Whew, I would learn. So we thank yep. you for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed this conversation about really what is the stock market uh, today? You know, Is it about fundamentals or about money being pumped in? It's probably still a little bit of both. Uh, but we'll see you next time on the Cash Flow Academy podcast. Thanks for listening, everyone. You've been listening to the Cash Flow Academy podcast with Andy Tanner. For more information on investing made easy, go to thecashflowacademy.com.